Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday's edition of S. Jeffrey Live. As you can see, we are traveling. Um, I'm actually headed to Fort Worth, and we're looking forward to it. Now, we got back late last night from our El Paso trip. Um, however, it wasn't just El Paso. We were in Kermit. We were in El Paso, um, Alpine. Um, I can't even remember all the cities we actually went to. Um, but we had an incredible time. And you know what was wonderful about it is we actually got to meet uh, a lot of young Democrats um, with uh, UT El Paso. Um, had an interview with uh, one of their reporters there. Uh, and as well, we uh, were able to meet with uh, a lot of the more tenured uh, population uh, down in that area. And it was exciting to see, for me, how excited they are about the upcoming 2018 election. Now, um, we <laughs> they're excited because at the Alabama race, which was last Tuesday, um, had you know finally uh, come to an end, and a Democrat won in Alabama, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, has been about. Uh, I think almost 30 years since the Democrat came out of Alabama. So that should um, give great hope, and it was giving hope to them, that it's possible. And what we have to do is really motivate um, people to vote, because as I've been saying all along, Texas is not a red state. Texas is just a non-voting state. And But I do have to give a shout out, um, because the major force behind the Alabama uh, uh, the Democrat um, winning the Alabama, the Alabama Senate race was the fact that the African American population actually came out in droves and truly um, was an incredible um, uh, force to be reckoned with, and and with even within the African American community, it was African American women that I believe they were at 98% of African-American women actually voted for Doug Jones, uh, the Democrat. And that is just um, in, truly incredible. And they're the ones that really turn um, the tide for, for that race. So I know that something similar is going to happen here in 2018 um, and we can all make it happen. We just have to get out there and pound the pavement and work the phones. And that's what we're doing. And that's what we will continue to do all the way to victory next November um, in 2018. I also wanted to discuss real quick the FCC ruling, which abolished the net neutrality um, law. Uh, I honestly never thought we'd even be discussing this. But then again, in our day and age, and in the current times, uh, it's, you know, anything's possible on what we're going to be fighting for um, moving ahead uh, with uh, our current president at the helm. <coughs> but I do have to say that the an open and accessible internet, it's something that has become vital to our democracy, just like free speech is vital to our uh, democracy. And the repeal of this rule of the net neutrality, uh, it signals a really dangerous step backwards, um, far backwards. And it just means that the free flow of information uh, will be controlled by a few large corporations. And that's not what um, the internet uh, should be based on. And it's a bad idea. And I'm, uh, I believe the um, Congress can step in and uh, provide a relief to that um, appealing the net neutrality law, the abolishing, I'm sorry. So um, I hope that they do. And if not, I'm sure there are going to be a flurry of lawsuits and we'll be paying attention to those to ensure that the net neutrality uh, is brought back to all of us. So, um, uh, I want to also, oh, real quick, this is really cool. We finally got our um, second shipment in, and they are the wonderful, it's our travel mugs. Um, let's see, 
I have to do it backwards from the camera, sorry. Um, it has Rise with Jeffrey Payne governor 2000, for governor 2018. And we also got our uh, second round of coffee mugs. Let's see, there we go. And inside they're blue. It's now on rec uh, recreational cannabis, I believe we need to go ahead and uh, legalize it. Uh, Actually, in California, Texans are the largest out-of-state population that actually uh, goes into Colorado and purchases uh, uh, legalized cannabis. We need to do that here. We need to tax it, and we also need to regulate it. And, you know, as many of you know, or most of you know by now, I am the owner of uh, a nightclub, a bar, and just like with alcohol, we need to have the same restrictions and the same rules. And we need to make sure that we monitor it. We may to, need to make sure that, um, you know, it's taxed. And it is a tax source, um, a revenue source for the state. Um, so we can put more money. <coughs> Pardon me, y'all. My allergies, they're shot. <coughs> so let's work on um, getting that legalized because I do believe it is a great resource um, for us as far as Texas uh, receiving more revenue. And as well, I believe that the social norm of how we uh, looked at cannabis in the past um, has changed and we need to legalize it. So thank you, Kevin, for asking uh, your questions on that. Uh, Sarah and Katie had asked me, um, if you take away the star testing, how do we fulfill the requirements? for federal funding. Uh, Sarah, that's a very good question and thank you. Understand that um, when I say taking away the STAR testing, there still needs to be a testing in place. The testing back when I was in school, which was a few years ago, um, more than a few, and was there to just to base where I was in the learning process. Um, and that's what it, our, our, that's what our testing needs to be, to ensure that I'm at the level I should be at. And then if I'm not, why am I not at that level? Is there a learning disability? Is there, a, is it because the teacher isn't teaching what the teacher needs to teach? Um, does the teacher need more education? Does the teacher need more resources? Um, you know, and then taking the results of the test to improve the students um, experience um, in garnering their education rather than using the test as a punishment uh, towards the student, towards the teacher, towards the school district. That is not what testing is supposed to be about. Now, the requirements of the federal government are that we provide testing and we can still provide that testing that is required by the federal government. Um, we can still provide it. However, what we need to do is make sure that we're using it in a positive and in, re in reinforcing it in a positive manner rather than using any type of testing as a, um, as a, um, this is what we're going to use to knock over someone's head. This is, you know, we're going to fire a teacher. We're going to, um, you know, punish a student. Uh, that's not what testing is about. And so, even though we're speaking about me uh, taking away the star testing, there still will be testing, but the results of those tests, those tested tests, excuse me, um, will be utilized in a manner that we're able to move forward um, in a positive direction rather than using it in the negative. Um, and so, Sarah, thank you for your question. Um, one last question before I look over and start answering some of your um, uh uh, questions. Um, uh, CC in Round Rock asks, how are we going to pay for all these programs? Um, well, it depends on the program. Uh, that's a good question, but it depends on the program, uh, such as education. Uh, we can fund it by closing the loopholes, which exist with large corporations receiving sweetheart deals and uh, massive property uh, tax. Um, the lowering of their property tax. So then it's put on, the, the major part of the bill is then put on individuals in their homes and apartments and so on. 
And so what we can do on schooling is close those loopholes because businesses need to understand that they have a vested interest in ensuring that our children are uh, educated because one day we're all going to retire, um, you know, I pray. Um, and But once we do retire, someone has to come in and replace us and it needs to be Texans and it needs to be educated Texans. And as well, um, when companies here actually, sorry, my phone dropped. Um, when companies here actually are um, expanding, then they need more workforce and we need to be able to provide that workforce. And that's why companies have a um, uh, vested interest in that. Now, if you're speaking about um, Medicaid, uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, it's we're calling the government, uh, federal government, and we're saying, please send us our money. That's already Texans' money. Uh, it belongs to us. So we need to tell them to send it to us so that we can actually have more access to 1.8 million people who lost access the moment that we refused to accept Medicaid expansion money. So by doing that, again, um, we were able to fund uh, Medicare, uh, individuals who are on Medicare. So it depends on the program, um, CC. It's a great question. Um, but to go through the whole litany, if you have a more specific one, CC, um, on how we're going to cover particular programs, please let me know. And I will, of course, um, reach out and let you know. Now then, let's see. Um, over on the side, uh, eight hours of testing. Uh, this is from John. Uh, eight hours of testing, not a whole month. Teaching to the test, yes. Go back to what we were doing. Uh, John, that's what I was referring to back when I was in school. Uh, we only had a, it was a one day test uh, and there were breaks in between. And, you know, one section was math and one section was English and one sec, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no one ever taught us to the test. We were just told, hey, you know, a couple of weeks before, we're going to be testing you. And we, we were tested. Um, the results should be, again, uh, getting back to the testing like John was speaking about, is just ensuring that I'm where I'm need, I need to be or where our child needs to be uh, in their educational uh, progress. So testing is a tool in the toolbox to make sure that our children are being um, adequately tested, uh, adequately educated, excuse me. So, John, I agree with you. Um, it doesn't, we don't need to t teach to the test uh, where many teachers are actually doing that. Um, uh, Tank actually says you're breaking up real bad. <laughs> I hope it got better. Uh, I don't know why, but we were losing cell service. We should be better now, but uh, post again if I'm not uh, doing as well. Um, we're not using a cell phone. Um, it's actually my computer with a Wi-Fi, so I do apologize for that, y'all. But um, I think things have worked out now. Um, but let me know if they're not. Uh, Steve, thank you. Um, hi, Jeffrey. What is your plan for dealing with net neutrality now that the SCC has reversed it? Um, first of all, we have to wait and see what the uh, state, I'm sorry, the federal legislature does, uh, the House of Reps and our U.S. Senators. Um, hopefully they will take it and actually uh, pass the law, which would then not be under just the FCC rule. So um, the FCC ruling, um, hopefully they will do that. I'm going to be upfront and honest with you. I have about as much hope in our U.S. Senate and our U.S. representatives right now um, that wouldn't feel it wouldn't feel a thimble right at this point. So hopefully they will do that. Also, we need to watch and see what um, lawsuits come out of it. If they do nothing um, in the Congress, U.S. Congress, um, let's see what the lawsuits do because. What we need to be doing, and as governor, what we need to be doing is going up to, um, I'm sorry, we're making a turn. Uh, we need to be going up to the, the uh, Washington and beating on doors and yelling and screaming and telling them what they need to be doing because obviously they don't have a whole lot of sense of direction right now, um, except to make sure that you, 
you know, for those of us who own jets, um, I don't know how many people on here own jets, but I don't. Um, but we're able to write that off. But a teacher can't write off supplies that she's buying for her students. You know, that makes sense. Um, so um, let's see. Um, I'm looking over here. Um, we have, let's see, um, Sybil, oh, in Galveston. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I travel for work and have noticed there seems to be a rise in the homeless population, especially in some of the state's larger cities. What do you feel can be done to help get these people off the streets and back to being productive citizens? Um, Sybil, that is a very good question. Homelessness um, is a problem. Um, and I know we need to look at places like Seattle, uh, Denver, um, uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, they all have um, very good programs in place in which they um, are actually handling the homeless uh, crisis um, much better than Texas has been handling it. Um, in fact, I think Texas in many ways has not been handling it, um, especially when it comes to our uh, vets that have returned home. Um, so we need to look at their plans. How can we tweak them to make it work in Texas? Um, and how can we tweak the plans so that they work in larger cities? And then also how, how would those programs work maybe differently in the more rural areas? It needs to be tackled. We need to handle it front on. And I believe uh, some of the issues that need to be uh, taken care of are, is the fact that um, we actually are taking care of mental health. Uh, mental health and uh, funding for mental health has been um, dramatically decreased um, to the point that it's almost non-existent. And what what we can do is we can then um, fund mental health like it should be. Have those individuals who are homeless, um, who have mental health problems, get them the services they need so that they can then turn around, pardon me, um, and then start training them with edu through educational, um, training them with a trade, such as being a mechanic or being um, uh, a plumber or anything like that. Or if they're uh, more interested in going to community college, going to community college, getting their associate degree, um, and for those who want to continue on to their bachelor's degree, allow them to do that. By doing that, um, once they have their, uh, for those who have mental health issues, um, once those issues are dealt with, and once they have the education that they need, then they become productive citizens. And then, and what I try to explain to everybody is then when you're a productive citizen of society, you're actually putting money back into the tax revenues uh, for the state. You, you are contributing back to the state. So what we need to do is, although we need to take care of them immediately in finding them uh, uh, food and housing and so on, we need to start dealing with all of our issues on the front end of the issue, not the back end. because we seem to be a very reactionary government here in Texas, um, rather than being proactive. And so I always advocate if there's an issue or if there's a problem, what has caused the problem? And then let's deal with it on the front end so that we don't have the problem on the back end. And people say, oh, well, you're spending more money on it and you're spending more money. It is, it costs less money on the front end to provide the services and provide the education that people need um, who are homeless, then it costs, it's less on the front end than it costs to take care of them on the back end. Um, by spending the money on the front end, and then they become productive citizens and they're putting money back into the state revenue, uh, you know, coffers, that is what we need. And then by doing that, Oh, I'm sorry, we just turned again. Uh, by doing that, then we're able to, <coughs> pardon me, um, then we're able to, uh, sorry, Christopher's, sorry, Christopher's driving and he's looking for something. So, um, but then 
what we're able to do is we handle things on the front end rather than the back end. We're able to then put that money that on the back end um, when they're productive and they're educated and they have jobs and they have housing um, and they're paying their own way. We were then able to, if any money was spent on the front end, whatever money was spent on the front end, we're getting that money back. And that's how you, that's how we deal with individuals. That's how we help individuals. We're, this is not a liberal idea. You know, to help people is not a liberal idea. Um, you know, and, and I'm tired of hearing that, you know, oh, well, Jeffrey, you want to give away everything. Uh, no, I don't want to give away everything. What I want to do is assist individuals who need assistance, uh, who need assistance, excuse me. And by doing that, you have, you have made an individual who is proud. They are, they're able to take care of not only themselves, but their, their family. Um, that's what we do. That's what society does. And I'm not sure when it became this huge liberal idea to take care of people. And that comes to education and healthcare, women's rights, um, the homeless problem. It's whatever issue you look at, we can, we can solve these issues and and it's an everybody issue. When you help your neighbor, you're you're being helped as well. And so we need to stop this uh, central centralist idea that um, you know if you want to help people, you're a liberal um, because it's not. It's a human. It's a it, it it's a human idea. It's not a liberal idea. So sorry, I got off on a little tangent there, but um, that's what that's how I feel about that. Um, Let's see. Um, Steve wrote, uh, here's something different. Any thoughts about possible assistance with after school programs? I know I see a lot of kids running around my neighborhood and that usually leads to trouble. <laughs> yeah, same thing in my neighborhood, Steve. Um, I do understand and yes, um, especially when it also comes to school lunch program, we also need to look at that. Um, I believe every child deserves um, breakfast and lunch. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, that is the only meal they receive. And so what we need to do is also remove the stigma of those individuals, uh, those students who are on the programs. And I believe well, how we do that is everyone gets a card. Um, those who are able to pay, pay for their breakfast and lunch. And those who are not able to pay, of course, the state is uh, paying for their portion. But if everyone across the board has a card, no one knows if one was paid by the state and one was paid by the family. Um, everyone's on the same playing field. And then the stigma of having a student having that card um, goes away because uh, or because they're in another line or they are receiving um special treatment um but there's a stigma associated with that that we need to take away uh from children at that age and i believe if you give that card to everyone um then problem solved um that's an easy solution now to after school um unfortunately because we haven't funded education uh schools have had to cut programs they've had to cut teachers that's why teachers classrooms are so large right now and by us funding education we can bring back um, more bands. We can bring back um, more after school activities, which is healthy for a child in their development into adulthood to be able to associate. And so I will say that by funding education, we can then look at after school programs. Um, that is imperative. We had them when I was in school. Um, and I didn't do band, by the way. Um, I was not musically inclined. Um, but, uh, you know, but by offering these after school programs, then for parents who are having to work till five, five thirty, um, you know, the child, you know, the, the term latchkey kid came up during my, uh, generation and I'm not going to tell you which generation that was. It was just way back. And the, 
what we can do is if students at the end of the school uh, time frame, uh, regular schooling, can then stay on board and take, go to band or go to a sporting um, practice or anything like that, then that's what we need to promote and that's what we need to have children be involved in. Um, even if it's like a glee club or if it's anything like that, um, where they can um, associate outside of the normal um, math, science, English type classrooms, um, where they're actually able to expand their horizons. And I, I believe that's what we can do. And thank you, Steve, very much for that. Um, uh, let's see. <coughs> well, oh, I just looked at the time. It's 1228. Um, I know we're usually a full hour. John, I see, you, I see you wrote a question. And John, I will get to that uh, next Friday's Ask Jeffrey. Um, but I have an appointment that I have to get to. Um, and I do apologize. I'm actually um, meeting with the Texas Coalition of Black uh, Democrats um, here in Tarrant County, uh, which is why <laughs> um, we were driving. Um, and we were losing signal. So I do apologize for those couple of portions where we were losing the signal. Um, but I do have to leave early because I am meeting with them and I do apologize. Um, but I appreciate all of you tuning in. Uh, we are on every Friday at 12 o'clock and, um, I will see you next Friday, uh, again, and it's 12 o'clock central standard time. And I will get to any, un, if I skipped any questions, because I'm doing this alone today. So I was kind of scanning over here um, and reading the questions that came in through email. So um, I do apologize for that. Um, but I will uh, get to your questions and, um, uh, and the ones that are listed, I'll do those first next week. So thank you so much. Remember, you can always email your questions to Ask Jeffrey Live at jeffreyfortexas.com and the four for Jeffrey for Texas, it's actually the number four. Um, and that's how we got a, a lot of our questions this time. So again, I apologize. I'm having to end early, uh, 30 minutes early, but we will always be here. We will always be uh, willing to answer any of your questions. I appreciate all of you tuning in today. And um, let's see. Um, remember oh, oh, online, remember we got our mugs in. Um, I don't know. I'm probably like blinding everybody now. I'm right in the sun. Um, and we got our uh, coffee mugs in. So if you go online, um, remember we're having the triple donation right now. So if you donate, I'm sorry, if you contribute, um, let's say $20, we have, I have two friends that will match. Each of them will match your $20 donation, uh, contribution. So it will be turn your 20 turns into 60. And then we have thank you gifts. So please make sure um, you go online at jeffreyfortexas.com and uh, you can click the link that's on the front page um, and look at a list of our thank you gifts. Um, it's basically just like public radio or public TV, um, except we don't send you a horrible Barry Manilow, you know, cassette tape. Um, we, <laughs> Christopher's looking at me like, oh, okay, I'm going to let this out. I actually love Barry Manilow. Um, so <laughs> there, now you've learned something about me and I probably lost, I don't know how many votes, but it's okay. Um, I hope y'all have a wonderful weekend. We are having a fundraiser tomorrow. Um, yes, we're having it at the Dallas Eagle and I appreciate, uh, the team of people who are hosting this for us. I truly appreciate it. Um, because everything we raise at the, um, uh, fundraiser tomorrow at seven o'clock at the Dallas Eagle will also be tripled. So, um, you know, I appreciate everyone. Uh, Michael, oh, where can we get the mugs? Oh, okay. Yes. Jeffrey for Um, that's where you can get them. So again, thank you so much for, um, <laughs> thank you, John. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, again, I need to run. I'm again, I'm running over time. Y'all have a great weekend. Um, we are basically everywhere and thank you, Christopher. Um, <laughs> that was the mug going across the, okay. Um, we always have fun in the car when we're traveling. Uh, again, the trip to El Paso, I think was how many hours, like nine hours, 11 hours. Um, it was a long ride. Um, but we're doing it many, many more times and, uh, January and February leading all the way up to the primary, 
uh, is just packed with events. And um, the whole team is ready. We're ready. And we're going all the way to next November 6th um, because we will win. And uh, we have the future of Texas. Um, and it, we, we have that site. We know what that is. And, you know, and when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean all of us, uh, including all of you. And I appreciate everyone's support. Again, thank you for tuning in. And I will see you next week, uh, if not sooner, at one of the events. So um, thank you again. And y'all take care. And um, I will see y'all soon. Bye, y'all.